Alright, ladies, so uh, since there's only four of this, four of us, um, does anyone not have a file? Does everyone have a file? What do you see here? I think it's definitely a file. We're just starting there. I, I don't know if you want us to go through our notes or not. We want to speak. Well, does anybody want to go ahead and let us know what they see on this? If nobody else says anything, I will. Okay, go ahead. And go ahead. Alrighty, so with the considerations that we're looking at, who establishes priority to the ball, um, I think that it was player, I believe it was blue 12, no, no, that was the foul, that was the person that made the foul, white 45, it has priority to the ball, I believe, and blue defender, I believe it is, comes in the back, kind of pushes white with medium force, and medium speed. Uh, the point of contact was um, the back of white 45 with the arm of blue 12 and she's of course coming from behind. She She's illegally using her arms as a tool. And I, just thought, I, I thought it was she challenged for the ball with an with unfair reckless force. Okay so you have a file, do you have, you have anything else here regardless of what the Hello. Okay. About uh, Christine? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, Christine. <laughs> sorry. Um, I think it's a foul as well. The player's coming in from behind, and she she can see she's she can see the person she's running into. Um, the other player obviously isn't aware of the player coming into her back. She's facing the ball, and she's going into her with more force than necessary like a medium force and kind of recklessly pushing her out of the way. So I think it's, it's, right, okay, so I think everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Christine, good point. No one is saying that the white white was actually the defender. You cannot see that contact coming, right? That's a very important thing that we want to look for. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add on this? Because I have to say, I do have a... So how, I have two questions, if you don't mind. My first question is how... What makes you say that white player has priority to the ball? What makes you say that she has priority to the ball? In my opinion, I think she is in the landing zone of where the ball is going to be, and she is in position to receive the ball and trap and have possession of the ball before the defender can get to it. And the defender only is able to get to the ball by going through white. Awesome, perfect. So that elaboration, I think it's important because uh, it's easy to say somebody has priority, but uh, that doesn't like, why do we say that? That piece is important. So I'm glad that you were able to elaborate on it. And I know this, this uh, session is not about upper body or illegal use of the arms, but April used the term using the arm as a tool. And I think you're referring to this thing about tool versus weapon. What, yes. what, is, what does it mean to use an arm as a tool? So in, in this case, I believe that a tool, she is trying to gain possession of the landing zone by putting her body more in, like, okay, this is, so she's not using her arm as a weapon and intent to hurt the player, but as a tool to gain possession and still play the ball. Right, exactly. So uh, I want something to remember when we talk about tool versus weapon, we tend to throw these terms very casually, but some of the examples of using an arm as a tool is, as April said, gaining a possession, but it also might include uh, protecting, a, pos uh, protecting uh, a spot or a location so that uh, nobody can get into your space. So protecting space while protecting the ball. But if you use your arm illegally, 
then you're using your arm as a tool to protect your space or to protect your ball or to gain access to the space. So uh, because you're familiar with the term tool already, I wanted you to uh, uh, go a step further to describe what that meant. So thank you. Thank you. So just a couple of still shots here. We'll see the initial contact. Um, and like I said, we have talked about the foul, which is a good thing you ladies weren't there. I did happen to see both the games that we happen to be looking at today. And this uh, player actually does not matter, but the blue is the attacking team. This is a throw in by the blue. And I guess she thought they were going to throw it a little bit further, but that didn't happen. So she tried to, like you say, use her body to come through the white defenders who were there waiting for the ball. Um, this blue player had also been a child on the field. Let's say she was a handful. Uh, you'll notice some things that I want you to notice when we're looking at this clip, although it's not about the aerial challenge, since we're all referees, this referee was in very good position to see this. And although he doesn't seem really urgent right now, he was close enough and he kept a, a good tab on this player. And at this point, this was enough that definitely needed to have this yellow card or something was going to escalate further because here's the, the next point. You know, she's got the elbow in the back, but it's not just that. She follows through and then we have the extra push with the arm. Because this is the where the referee's blowing the whistle and he's coming over. What do we notice about him? He has the yellow already. <coughs> he has the yellow. Uh, and why do you think he might do that, ladies? Two. Sorry. Why do you think it might help to have that yellow already out, Christine? Did you, did you say Christy or Christine? Uh, go ahead, Christy. That's fine. I said tough with both of you in. Um, go ahead, Christy. So if you said that that blue attacker had been kind of a problem child the whole game, uh, the white team might be getting fed up with her, and so having the card in your hand is kind of a good visual to like keep the white team calm because they like see the yellow card already in your hand and they know that you're going to give it rather than like waiting to pull it out when you get closer to the girl because then they might be upset and mad that you're not giving it right away. That's excellent. That's exactly right because like I said, this was getting a little bit heated and not that it matters, but fans were getting heated, coaches were getting a little heated and like I say, the players want to know you're taking care of things so it helps. There's no reason not to have that out as for coming over to the player. And so his next step, he's already pulled out the card so everybody knows it's coming and then continues on with his management. Right, he's talking to the player, he's just moving up the field with her while they're setting the ball. So use your downtime to help you manage players. Uh, if you're not doing that already, it will really help you uh, go further ahead in maybe your next match. All right. And we are moving on to this video. We'll look at the video on the Notice in this clip we do actually two aerial challenges. Very in there. So two things. Um, this clip lady. One has anything there. Yeah. Um. <laughs> no, go right it. Yeah. Um I just slow it down you know, for the my feet is a little slow, but, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it looks like the defender's arm is away from their body. He's jumping into the header. It's a, his arm is away from the body and goes right into the neck of the attacker. I think the attacker is blue. I don't, I don't want to look back at the screenshot because I just keep messing up my movement every time. But, um, the first defender actually was very much, um, not only using his arm, honestly, to gain that, that advantage, but where his arm was landing in respect to the individual is quite dangerous. Um, so he was definitely acting with complete disregard for his opponent. 
And then the second challenge, um, confuse me a little bit why the referee chose to call that particular one, because when I was watching it, you know, it, look, it seems at least to me that both the attacker and defender have the right to the ball, the right to the space. It's kind of in between them. However, the defender is looking up the entire time. And Grady does have to make a little bit of like, you know, a sideways backward movement to get to the ball. However, the attacker actually looked like he was looking forward and saw exactly where the defender was. Whereas the defender didn't have any reference necessarily outside of purple vision as to where the attacker was. And the attacker just kind of went right into the side of him. So um, I think the referee definitely missed the first call. And um, the second call, not quite sure um, I agree with, with that decision either. That's my, that's my two cents. Brittany, you were not wrong in what you saw with the defender's arm coming up to kind of help him reach the ball. But I didn't think that his arm hit the neck. I thought it was like the upper back close to insinuate that there was possibly like a card or just a foul. Because what I'm thinking is the first one, yeah, I thought the referee missed it and it was definitely a foul because I thought it was unfair. Um, and it, like an illegal use of his arms as well as jumping at the player. Uh, or not. So um, I just kind of want to ask, were you thinking foul or following hard for the first one? I mean, so again, I, I feel kind of limited by I can't, the feed just isn't great enough for me to be able to discernibly see, but it looked like the way his, the guy's head kind of snapped forward that it was, you know, maybe it was upper back, but it was close to the neck. And the reason why I was mentioning that is because where that arm is and where you're pushing off from the individual, it's going to change, you know, the level of disregard the um, individual is showing for the opponent. Um, you know, there's a difference, I think, between you're pushing off in someone's lower back. You're definitely pushing their whole body forward, yes. But when you're getting closer up to the neck, you're now making it where, like, you're compromising a lot more of the individual. Like, you're getting near their off their central operating system. Like, that neck snapping forward and the possibility of getting hit and uh, drilled in the head is, I think, definitely a little bit more of a um, salient. So, um, that's why I was cons that's why I'm just taking that consideration. Because it's not only, you know, the intensity of contact, but, like, that point of contact is really important, too, because... You know, he, you said he jumps into the guy, um, and that arm is coming away from the body, and these kids look old enough. They know exactly what they're doing. So, you know, just because the other guy didn't jump as high, it doesn't matter. Um, so that that's why I, I'd have to look back at it again, um, I guess, to see exactly where it went. But, um, yeah, I, that's why I was just I totally understand. location. So I, I totally get it. And I think that player safety comes first and foremost. I think that's where you're, where you're coming from as well, and I think that's great. Um, in, in, where did you think that the intensity was for this challenge, as well as the speed? Mm, let me see, I'd actually have to look back at that again. I mean, it was like a locked door. No, you're totally fine. Sorry, I'm just like, I didn't have too much time to look at these before. And, so no, I wouldn't say the intensity is very high at all in that situation. Green was definitely, you know, pushed forward, but didn't seem too terribly agitated by it. But then again, they just really quickly got a foul. So I think if you take that into consideration, you can just do um, just a foul in that particular instance. Okay. Yeah. No, like that's into, and I just think it's interesting. So when I when I'm thinking of intensity and speed, I'm also thinking about the cards that come with like the low, medium, and high. When I think of high intensity, I'm thinking red card. So what I was thinking about this clip was low, low intensity, low um, speed. I know that like the aerial challenge happened, but I, I I do agree. I think we're on the same page with just a foul for the first one. Okay, so let's hear from Christine and Christy. For the first, who, maybe we should have you guys type it in the public uh, chat room here. Does anybody 
not have, have does anybody have a file for the first aerial challenge wait do you want us to type in the chat or? Or, or, or just uh I just would like to know if we're all on the same page. Do, are you all thinking this is a foul for the first year of challenge? Yeah, yeah I, agree I agree with what Brittany said. Okay. I agree too. Um, and I agree with April that I think it's like a low speed and low intensity. Okay, okay. and for the for second. second? The second I don't think was, <laughs> I, I was with Brittany um that i was kind of confused with it honestly i thought that they were both looking up at the ball and it was a 50 50 challenge okay i didn't think that that was going to be the foul that i would call i didn't think it was a foul okay and christine and christine are, are you both thinking that the second area is also not a foul i had like a hard time with it because like what april said they're both like looking up at the ball Enough, and they're yes. both not in that position in the space. They're both moving into it at like the same time. They they were no one had established that space really prior. And, and those, those are the things, things that we are thinking about. about. That's correct. That's correct. Because during the course of regular play, there's going to be contact. Correct. So they both are going up simultaneously. They're both heading in for the ball. Are they both? In an upright position, maybe someone is slightly bent, but essentially they're both playing for the ball, both focused on the ball, and contact happens. Um, Nikki, did you have anything to add? So for, for the first one, for you guys saying that the, so if the way you guys were talking about it is that you were saying that White was jumping in the hip. So I think you guys agreed that, um, or it sounded like a few of you guys agreed that white was jumping supposedly into green in that moment. What were you guys looking at in particular when you were making that determination? I was looking at, so after the direct free kick happened, where the landing zone was and where the players were and how they went up into the challenge. Both screens happen to be, or the center screen, area that's challenge right, number two is it. actually, <laughs> right, I say, no, that's like, is actually the contact. Looks like both players are just going up for the ball. Yes, there's contact, but at this point, the, the players, they're going question, up for the ball. Yep, and what, question for what you guys in that said? instance. Would you consider this normal contact? So nor by normal, I mean fair contact. Or would you consider this unfair, kind of abnormal contact? Um, I thought it was unfair because I thought that the defender White was uh, jumping into the back of Green. Okay. The well, others. if I'm looking yep. at it more, oh, I'm sorry, Nicole. Oh no, I was just gonna say other people's opinions too. Um. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like rewatching it 20 million times, right? Um. I think my main issue I'm having with this is where his arm is going as he's at the peak of jumping and coming down. I think that if he may be, he may be able to keep that arm completely in because that's what created the situation. Um, he may have been fine, but I think it's, it's when, yeah. I'm backpedaling a little bit. Like my issue with what he's doing is us with the movement of that that left arm or whatever arm that is. So I could see the claim that they both could have equal, you know, um, they both are, could fairly be. Uh, what's the word? Sorry. Um, going for the ball, but um, his arm is what does it for me and makes it a foul. So I guess that's in my mind how he unfairly challenges him is that he then makes his space more more prevalent and more um, accessible because of that arm movement. I'm gonna jump in here real quick. Um, Good. I want to talk about three things here, and uh, before that, I want to set the stage up. When we watch a video, and one day maybe you will become a VAR. So when you watch a video. 
you use slow motion and still picture to identify the point of contact. You use natural speed video to judge the severity of an offense. So this, this is a universal rule. Doesn't matter if it's the US, if it's U10, if it's the World Cup. Severity of offense, natural speed, point of contact, slow-mo or still picture. So with that in mind, let's establish the first point, a point of contact. I do agree that there's a contact with the, probably the forearm of the white player. If you use the technology of slow-mo and still picture, exactly where does the arm hit? Because I've heard some people saying the back, some people saying the head, some people saying the neck. So let's establish where the arm actually goes because head is different story than a back. Does anyone have the answer to this question, the point of contact? I thought it was the upper back. Upper back. It is, I think I, I, I do agree that it is upper back. And, you know, again, it, it, it's fair to argue that the quality of the picture is not good enough to really judge, but I tend to agree that it's upper back. Um, so if you want youth games, the quality of the clips won't be as good as a pro match, but let's say that this is upper back contact. Now, the second point I want to ask you about is the body orientation. Basically, the green player's body orientation is easy. The ball is coming from, from the front, basically. He's, he can see where the ball is coming from. I think you also agree that originally, white player is facing the same direction, so he knows how the ball is coming. At the moment of contact, how does white player's body orientation change? Does he continue to face the same way the green player is facing? Or does his body rotate? So I was going to mention this earlier. Um, it kind of seems like the green player, like, always as the ball's in the air, he always has his back to the goal, where the white player starts with his back to the goal, and then, like, in the air, kind of like when he's going up for the jump, he all of a sudden, like, turns, and so he's, like, perpendicular to the green player, and I think that's why, like, he then his arm gets extended and, like, more involved, and for me, like, that's where it enters more into, like, foul territory, whereas if he would have just stayed with his back to the goal and gone up straight, he probably, like, it wouldn't have been a foul. Okay, so I can see Chris's point, and I, I agree that the white player rotates, and when you rotate, you can even imagine this, you're basically you're facing a computer screen right now, and you're not going to hit your computer screen with your arm, but if you rotate your body, your left arm or right arm is going to be close to the, the computer screen. Now, both white and green are moving. So in order for this arm contact to be worthy of a foul, remember, pushing in itself is not a foul. Trifling pushing is not a foul. It needs to be careless. It needs to be reckless. It needs to be excessive force. So just because there's a push doesn't mean it's a foul. So if for this arm contact to be a foul, you need to be able to say that there is a push that is careless, not just contact. So this, so uh, that piece is about severity of offense. We have established the body orientation and the point of contact with slow-mo and still shot. So we use the natural speed view to see if there is a push by the arm or if it's a contact, if it's contact with the arm. And now that now we have to watch natural speed. And one of the great sayings that I have heard from one of the my assessor was, as a referee, imagine that you have all of your M&Ms or Skittles scattered across the table. And you like your M&Ms, you like your Skittles. So you have to collect every single Skittle and each skittle is piece of information that is on the field for you to make the right call. And one piece of skittle here is the reaction of green players. Not that we have to make a call based on reaction of players, but I'm kind of guiding you to a certain direction, at least for this first offense, that maybe those play, that play that got hit allegedly 
and then two green players in the neighborhood, their reactions might say something about this actual severity of offense that is observed on the field. So that's all I have. So Nikki or Sue, it's yours. So using those little skittles, I attempted to at least stop it. <laughs> We're pretty much right one um, green after the first green guy after the kind. What, what direction is he actually pointing to for the ref? Is he turning around saying like, why the hell didn't I get a call? Or is he actually pointing to one of his other players asking for the call for that guy? Ladies, anybody see what we're talking about for that first hit? What's the reaction of the players? Uh, for the first challenge, the green player really could, couldn't care less. And then for the second challenge, the green player who's involved in the first challenge is like, well, ref, why didn't you call that? So obviously he's more upset about the second challenge than the challenge that happened to him. So it, as Mia was pointing out, not that it has to make your call at all, but, but it's one of those little, again, little nuggets of information that you can kind of take in is that as we, we all know this is a contact sport, that there's going to be some sort of contact to help decipher between that kind of trifling and careless, these are the little things that we can, can start looking at. And it's an all honesty going to vary. That's one of the things that's going to vary from level to level. So what you see on here is probably going to be different than a player's reaction on a 12 game. Mainly because we then you have two different heights and the little kid just like flies for no reason. <laughs> but the, those are those little pieces of information that you can start looking at to help decide this. On top of that, so I think you guys all picked up on the, the second one seems a little, a little bit odd. Uh, I, I will say after watching numerous videos, this sort of call, especially around the midfield, is not uncommon. When I say you guys, I mean like regionals and below. We, we've seen it on DCFC games, we've seen it on Flip Bucks games, we've seen it on State Cup games. Um, I, I will be fully honest, it, it seems like you guys are just making stuff up because you think he's something you could be, oh no, the game's getting too rough, okay, here we go, it's close enough, we're going with it. Um, it and that's not what, how we want to roughing games. Uh, trust your eyes, it, if the game doesn't present you with a foul, you don't need to call a random foul that just confuses everybody that isn't actually there. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. So, other piece, what have you guys noticed about these past two clips? Where, where do aerial challenges typically happen? Or like, after what event do aerial challenges typically happen? Usually after you throw in or a direct free kick in the center of the field. Okay, so we've heard direct free kick. Anybody else? In general, soccer is stop and play, regardless if it's going out of bounds or it's a free kick, goal kick, corner kick. Like, there's time, you know, it's a stop and play and people are able to set up. Perfect. So, typically a static play. So, it, in particular for this one, again, static play, that first challenge there. Do you think the ref's position is great there? So, nope. I, I will be fully honest, I typically don't harp on positioning on static plays. Static plays, even the fattest ref in the world, can be in the right spot for that. <laughs> uh, and these are instances you can get it right. So on a static play, don't be lazy on it. Can't pay attention. Um, get Basically, start your initial spot where you should be. Uh, and then read it a little bit. Read where that landing zone is going to be. April, I think you were the one that, phrased, or that used the term landing zone earlier. Read where that landing zone is and adjust yourself as need be. Typically, it doesn't mean you're gonna to have to sprint somewhere. It's normally just taking a couple steps and just making sure that you actually have an optimal view of what, uh, of that aerial challenge. So for what you guys were saying, from where the rock was standing on that first challenge, what could he see from there? I mean, I he, he had zero angles, so all he's probably seeing is the two, two players going up, maybe one going forward a little bit, but you know, not not any dramatic fall or anything, probably nothing to make him feel like anything terrible is happening. I mean, he, yeah. He had zero angle. He had, I don't think he could see literally 
anything happening with their upper bodies at all. So with that too, on the second one, is he better, worse? I mean, I think by pure to hook, he has, I guess, what you could consider an angle. Um, but I think he could be in a little bit more. I, I honestly think with the second one, he just got in his own head and he felt like he missed something, so he had to go ahead and call something in favor of me. Um, because I think he has the angle at least to see that the green player was going just as much into the guy, at, at the white player, as the white player possibly was. So, um, but I guess he maybe had a better angle, but he's kind of far away too. He was being lazy. Yeah. He was being lazy. I'm really glad that Nikki's brought this up because yes, we were really discussing aerial challenges, but just the differences in the referees, how they're handling things and how they're positioned and the effort they're putting into their game. Yes, this is a, a let's say a poor or a much poorer performance by this referee because he is giving no effort whatsoever, no no effort to get into that better position so we might see something that could possibly be happening. And um, Brittany, I think you're exactly right that he felt like he might have missed something and I'll agree that he just called this one and the, we all agree that the first one was probably the worst uh, and essentially we don't think there's anything even there on the second one and that is the one he, he whistled. So um, we need effort by the referee. I'm just also having on that too, like where the clip I think ends is Green actually has a player going into the box. Um, off that kick, so like, like very well that created means. a situation that if that's, you know, a game critical decision and, and where um, is he? you know, an assessment fail, an assessment fail. I can't even see him in the frame. Oh, and the, like, we're both on the same frame here. I like, was exactly I don't want to hear it. It's go. not that hot in Michigan. It's not that cold. <laughs> you hear your butt. I think he's still at the center circle yes for this which these are 17 year old boys at the final now do you think things might get heated and you might want to be a little closer right um, so I'm glad all you ladies can see that that's a good thing and just be fit can't do the game don't accept the game because this isn't doing the game justice because if the green team does score and it's a 1-0 game and this is how it ends like enjoy looking at your assessor and being like, well, they had 90 minutes to score back. Like, you know, this is soccer, 20 million goals aren't scored a game. Like yeah. fitness you can control. So control what you can control. If you're not fit enough, like that's your, that is on you. That's not on anyone else. And that's, uh, uh, and everybody, everybody is always working on fitness and that is excellent. This is not the case for this referee. This referee is a college player and can run circles around these boys he should be running circles around these boys. His fitness is far above any of these players. Uh, and he just is not giving any effort. And that is something we consider for moving on. Yes, right? Or a good teaching point here. So where, where could we be? What should he have been doing uh, to keep things under control? You know, and to make sure that we're not missing fouls and calling fouls that may not be there because we're not giving the effort, so. If anything, I feel like if he really was feeling internally flustered by the fact that he felt like he missed something and then he just created something, then um, I don't know what year this, you know, this is in, um, but how to slow the game down. You just had two big aerial challenges, like don't let them do a quick restart, like enforce some sort of game management or something, but. Here we go. So our aerial you know, clip things that we considered. <clears throat> we all talked about who initiated the contact for the girls. The blue throw in, the attacker blue was actually the one that committed the foul, right? So she uh, had, the, had the contact. And since 
she was behind white, she could not see it coming, right? So we have that elbow to the back of the white with the medium force. So I think we all agree there. Definitely foul, yellow card for reckless, direct free kick for white. Well, that's what we saw in the clip. Like say, with what you added, this happened to be her second. So it ended up being a red card, but, but if this was the only, or the first that she had, in the game, it would have just been her first yellow card. Uh, for the boys' matches, we have clip A and B. The first one to A being the initial, who is initiating the contact. Again, the defender, um, and can expect the contact. Well, maybe he saw him, but not really because he turned. Um, it was from behind, but again, we were discussing low speed and we had minimal contact. They both really were playing the ball, one pivoting in the air. They were both there at the same time, for the most part, straight up in the air, right? Everybody was playing for the ball. So this would deem as normal ball contact. So no foul here was correct decision by the referee. No discipline should play down, which they did, and all of the boys wanted to play on at that point. Like we said, we noticed that, that Green still wanted to play on, so they didn't have any issue with it. And then for the second one that happened immediately after, both were going up at the same time. Green a little bit bent, leaning forward. Correct. They're both there at the same time the ball came. And it was pretty clear that this is still normal contact for this level of play for the boys. The referee did call it in this instant. You'd have to discuss with him for whatever reason. Brittany gave a pretty good scenario, which I think is spot on. But, you know, we always need to ask them what did they see or why were they calling this one and not the first one to make sure they're all on the same page and that we'll get it for the next time. So this one should not have been a foul. Uh, and should not have been called. However, in this case, it was. So just to avoid misunderstanding, I'm not saying that we call based on how players react, but I am also saying mm -hmm. that uh, it's one of the pieces of information that sometimes could be helpful. So you take it with a grain of salt, but you know, some, sometimes it's good to pay attention to that sort of information as well. And the way I have always thought about making these not really makeup calls, but those called the phantom decisions in the midfield to make players feel better about whatever. The way I always thought about it is if I do not have the ability to officiate a match without making that phantom call, then I shouldn't be refing that game in the first place. So just making those phantom calls and then surviving, it's not doing any good to the game. So I wanted to challenge myself not to make those calls and still survive. And sometimes, because I didn't make those phantom calls, I miserably failed. But at least I could say that I tried. So one thing I would encourage you to do to improve your own skills is to really be honest with what you see and then call based on it. And then you tweak. We didn't talk about spa or dog so. Those are clear cut things. Here we're talking about things that can involve some gray zone. What is careless? What is trifling? That line in between is defined, but loosely. So after you watch more and more videos, you begin to see where that line should be. And the more videos we watch together, we can standardize what is, where those lines are uh, drawn. And we are doing the same thing with assessors, mentors. So they will have similar uh, standard with uh, all of you as referees. So my goal is to have that standard set so that there will be individual differences, but we also know when something is reckless or when something is just trifling or careless. So uh, that's something that I wanted to emphasize at the end. Yeah, 